He says the church did everything it could to frustrate the proceedings. I was so annoyed at one stage I wrote to the then Archbishop Connell um, because I didn't know if he, if, if he realised what was going on for two years that there was this legal correspondence going back and forward from my solicitors to Ivan Payne's solicitors. And um, within very short time of me writing to, Ar to the Archbishop of Dublin, um, the case was settled out of court. And, um, and then I decided that I now had the final piece of proof, if I ever needed it, that anything I might say about this now was, was, was true. Early in '95, the Arch Archbishop Connell went on record as saying, Diocesan funds are not used in any way for the purpose of compensation. But later that year it transpired that two years earlier, two years prior to that interview, he had um, helped Ivan Payne pay compensation uh, with a loan from the Austin funds. Um, so that got him into a lot of trouble. In a surprising number of cases, the kids did tell their parents and the parents believed them. So, you know, that, that does give the lie to quite a lot of our preconceptions. But in the cases where they told and where their parents believed them, the first port of call of the parents was to the parish priest because that is what they knew. They immediately expected that the parish priest would deal with this. It wouldn't expose their, their, their church, you know, in, whom in which they had invested so much time and energy to, to scandal or to ridicule, that the parish priest and the bishop would immediately deal with the offending priest in whatever way it was appropriate, would be sent away, and it would, this would stop. And, of course, that didn't happen. The opposite happened. To the resounding shock of so many of these families, they found themselves turned into pariahs within their local communities. They were condemned from Hythe without understanding why, by the parish priests, by the other priests, they were isolated. In part three, the scale of the abuse and the cover-up emerges. The stories are about the most hellish and miserable that, uh, and awful that you can possibly imagine. The cover-up was concerted and might well have succeeded were it not for the determination of the victims and the growing evidence that clerical abuse was a much bigger problem than anyone could ever have imagined. To this day, Father Brendan Smith is considered to be one of the worst paedophile priests ever convicted. He was sentenced in 1994 and died in prison in 1997. The case opened the clerical abuse floodgates. The stories are about the most hellish and miserable that, uh, and awful that you can possibly imagine. I mean, and the, and the sort of the scale of human evil, some of the things done to these people, uh, to these victims, could hardly be exceeded. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, as horrible and as awful as could be, really. As the scale of the abuse became known, there was a challenge to the Church's almighty authority. Michael McDowell, the former uh, Justice Minister, rather provocatively in the Dáil claimed that uh, the Church's internal rules, its canon law, had no more status in Irish law uh, than, than rules relating to golf clubs. And that was a massive moment um, in the relationship between the Church and State because the State had been hugely uh, deferential uh, towards the Church up until that point. And then he announced the decision to um, open up this inquiry into it. But certainly um, for a long, long time, the Church you know, nearly deemed itself above the law. But at the same time, it was using the civil law to protect itself. As a percentage, you know, much has been made of the fact that uh, a, a very small percentage of people are actually abused by priests. To my mind, it's not really the point. I mean, the point about this is to actually look at structures and systems and um, power setups, if you like, within society and how they respond when it becomes apparent that children are at risk. And what you had in this case was you had uh, a, an enormous edifice of power within society with tentacles uh, into lots of areas where contact is established on a quite an intimate level with children um, being absolutely disgraceful in terms of failing in its responsibility to protect their safety. And one of the things that's very important to remember, when, 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 you know, when you see a victim or a survivor today, they may, be, it may, look, they may be, look like healthy, strong men or women, but when they, were, when they went through what they went through, they were, they were children. Even as the scandals emerged, the church was doing everything it could to limit the damage. 
what was not known when these revelations of abuse started to filter into the public domain was that in 1986, Cardinal Desmond Connell's um, uh, predecessor in the Dublin Diocese, Archbishop Kevin McNamara, had actually taken out an insurance policy from civil claims um, based on legal advice that he had received. In 1998, when Cardinal Desmond Connell was appointed as Archbishop, that legal advice was circulated to, to all bishops throughout the country, and that advice formed the, bishop, uh, formed the basis of a national insurance policy that the church had. So at the time when it was saying it didn't know about the fact of the abuse, the nature of it or the prevalence of it, it was actually insuring itself against civil claims. Mary says the full extent of clerical abuse will never be known, as many victims take their own lives. And even in the case of Father McGuinness, she claims many victims never came forward. I have spoken to many other victims of his who have not actually come forward. They feel at this point he has been convicted, he's out of circulation. But I think, like all paedophiles, it is a career, they, they don't change and I think there's probably many victims out there. After Andrew went to the media, Payne was convicted in 1998 and spent four and a half years in prison. I'm really making the point that I was sexually abused by a priest as a child. As an adult, I've now been compensated, but that man is still serving priests in a Dublin parish. And I was putting that information into public domain, basically saying, what do you think of that? As parents, at the length and breadth of this country, uh, where the Catholic Church is in your parishes, what, you know, what do you want to do with that information? And there wasn't much of a response. The Catholic Church de denied any knowledge of the incident. So I'd been compensated in 93, and in 94, the Catholic Church's position was the question of money does not arise. Payne was eventually convicted in 1998 and served four and a half years in prison. We travelled to a small village close to Aberdare in South Wales in an attempt to speak with Ivan Payne. We discovered he had recently moved from the area after his home had been attacked. Well, I spoke to him, you know, as a, as a neighbour, but uh, he seemed a really nice uh, fella, I've got to be honest. But, uh, you know, really shocked because he was tidy enough, you know. You know, he, he cleaned that front garden over there, and it was like a jungle, he cleaned all that. He cleaned all the back lane up where he was living, planted yeah, flowers. He had to put the fencing up here. Yeah. Yes. Oh, he was quite good. He was a proper gentleman, he was. He told, us to, him for Charles. He told us to call him Charles. I've been doing this job for 20 years now, and nothing surprises me what I see every day with respect to news. But when I looked into the background of uh, Ivan Payne, uh, the crimes are the most, the vilest I've ever heard of, and um, we had no option but to put it on our front page. I'm as stunned today as you are to find out that he's moved out of the area and our main concern again is of course where has he gone? Is he in another village in our area? Has he gone back to Ireland? I mean he could be, he, well he is, he's living next door to someone, uh, could be a young family, could be an elderly couple who again will get, gain his trust and um, you know. In part four, the diocese braces itself for a devastating report. I think it is going to be staggering. I think it's going to lead to another revolt. The many years of campaigning by victims will soon bear fruit in the form of a report into the Dublin Archdiocese by Justice Yvonne Murphy. It promises to give some sense of how widespread the abuse was and the extent of the cover-up. I have provided the, the Commission with, uh, uh, with about 60,000 documents and they aren't bits of paper, they're stories, they're, in, they're, they're telling uh, uh, of the suffering of people and of the, 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 the way in which that suffering was, was dealt with. And uh, I can simply repeat what I said before, we're all going to be again shocked by, by what took place. I, mean, I, I gave, I've told my, my, my own priest that one weekend I, I decided to try and get through as many of these, read these documents. I came to a stage on a Sunday afternoon and simply threw them on the ground because I couldn't keep reading. Uh, and uh, you know, this, is the, you know, that, they're, they're, this is reality. Uh, it can't be hidden and it shouldn't be hidden. Whatever we think about 
what Ryan said about the religious orders. And I think that's the death knell of religious orders in Ireland. I think that the Dublin report, the Murphy report, will be the death knell of the institutional organised church in Ireland because I don't think that people will be able to look a bishop in the eye or a priest in the eye after that report, given what happened in the name of all of those people and what was done to the families who so, so courageously came forward.